When the crack epidemic of the 1980s had infiltrated New York City, few neighborhoods saw a bigger rise in the amount of drug users or the amount of drug suppliers than uptown Manhattan. In the mid-80s, when the neighborhood of Washington Heights was experiencing the chaotic effects of the crack pandemic, they also experienced a heavy influx of immigrants from the Dominican Republic. A sizable portion of these Dominican immigrants were involved in the drug trade, and soon Upper Manhattan saw the emergence of Dominican drug gangs. One of those early Dominican gangs to emerge was the Jerry Curls. As the name would suggest, they earned this nickname because the crew wore their hair in a glistening, loosely curled hairstyle, which was popular amongst African Americans and Afro Latinos at the time. The Jerry Curl gang was headed by the five Martinez brothers. The oldest brother, Cesar, nicknamed Papin. The next oldest, Rafael, AKA Rafi. Then Julian, known as Augusto. Then Lorenzo, a.k.a. Loren. And lastly, the youngest brother, Daniel, as well as one of their uncles, known only as Moreta. Rafael Rafi Martinez was the first to immigrate to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic in the mid-80s while he was in his teens, and he would become the leader of the Jerry Curl Gang. Rafi quickly began his life of crime in New York City, first starting out as a car thief, then shifting his business to drug dealing. By the age of 20, Rafi had partnered up with a friend of his named Chino and began hustling on the streets of Washington Heights. In 1987, while Rafi was lying on the couch, his partner and close friend Chino shot him in the head. Rafi survived the shooting but had to spend several months in the hospital recuperating and suffered a lifelong limp as a result. Upon returning from the hospital, Rafi went right back to his drug business, but now he decided that the only people he could trust was family. So over the next year and a half, Rafi brought his four brothers and uncle from the Dominican Republic to New York City to join him. Rafi bought phony Dominican passports for all of them at a cost of around $3,000. Upon arriving to New York, they would immediately get involved in his drug business. By the late 80s, the entire gang had adopted the Jerry Curl hairstyle. Like how many gangs often use a common trait for members to be identifiable as part of a bigger organization, this hairstyle was Rafi's way to give his crew an ostensible mark. Rafi sent every member who joined the gang to the same barbershop to have the Jerry Curl hairstyle implemented. The Jerry Curls began operating out of a 10-story building right here at 550 West 157th Street, just at the foot of the Washington Heights neighborhood. Their business was cocaine and they had set up shop in two of the building's apartments and were selling to both users and dealers. The Jerry Curls weren't just some run-of-the-mill crew of unorganized drug dealers. They had a hierarchy and system of efficiency where they employed bookkeepers and managers for every role in their operation. This sidewalk right behind me was once busy with the gang's operations 24-7, and they had monopolized the payphones across the street so much that it was practically inaccessible to anyone else. The Jerry Curl Gang quickly earned a frightening reputation in the streets and was feared by local residents as well as other gangs. They became known for their brazen and random acts of violence, which included shooting at civilians, intimidating people at random, and murdering anybody who dare cross them. On the rooftop of their building, a man had been shot, stabbed, and set on fire while his hands were tied behind his back. When authorities found the man's charred corpse on the roof, it was understood to be the work of the Jerry Curl Gang. The dead body was never identified. In 1989, the oldest brother, Papin Martinez, was involved in a drug deal gone bad when thieves attempted to rob him of five kilos of cocaine and gunfire was exchanged. Papin wounded one of the thieves, killed the other one, but he was shot in the chest. Papin was soon arrested and five kilos were recovered from a bloody sack. Rafi Martinez posted the bail for his older brother who never returned to court to face charges. A few months after this, an officer had responded to a call of shots fired in the building. When he knocked on the door of one of the Jerry Curl's business apartments, he was met with gunfire by Augusto Martinez and a volley of bullets was exchanged. Augusto was arrested, and once again, Rafi was there to bail out one of his partners and brothers. 
Local authorities became well aware of the gang's operations. NYPD officer James Gilmore of the 34th Precinct was put in charge of investigating the crew's activities and had set up a system where tenants were encouraged to secretly call in and report the interactions of the gang. The Jerry Curls drug business was now raking in over $100,000 a week. In classic drug dealer fashion, the Jerry Curls were loud and flashy. They dressed in designer clothes, expensive jewelry, and drove around town in Mercedes and Jeeps painted in gold. Officer Gilmore's system eventually paid off and they raided one of the Jerry Curls apartments where they confiscated 12 ounces of cocaine and two guns. A few months later, another raid turned up four ounces of cocaine. Although the Jerry Curls operation may have been slightly hindered, the apartments they were operating out of were either vacant ones they had broken into or had rented under aliases, so nobody was connected to the bust. Soon, a gang member would be specifically assigned to keep an eye on Officer Gilmore's whereabouts while he was on duty. Gilmore was arresting both buyers and sellers and looked for any legal opportunity to have one of the Jerry Curl's gold-painted vehicles towed. Around this time, the 34th Precinct received numerous death threats. Due to the mounting pressure, the Jerry Curl shifted their operations a few blocks down the street to a six-story building at 614 West 157th Street. The gang's territory was West 157th Street from Morgan Place to Riverside Drive. Since this building fell out of Officer Gilmore's jurisdiction and the NYPD would have to start an entire new operation from scratch, the residents would have to learn how to deal with their new Dominican neighbors all on their own. With the increase in crime and gang activity, many residents had fled the area and uptown Manhattan from Harlem to Inwood had experienced a major downturn. It became neglected by landlords, the city, and the police department. Buildings became rundown slums, sanitation services declined, and flagrant drug dealing and prostitution was rampant. By the time the Jerry Curls moved into this U-shaped building, there wasn't even locks on the front doors. Like their previous setup, the Jerry Curls used two apartments in this building to operate out of. They hired expert contractors to rig the apartment with trickery and had installed secret trap doors, which concealed stashes of guns, money, and drugs. The Jerry Curls carried out most of their business within the confines of these two apartments. While this proved to be an innovative and ideal arrangement for the Jerry Curls, their takeover of the building had left the tenants living in fear of the gang's business, which was in operation 24-7. One tenant described it as being an open house where the gang operated like the building's doorman. One day, police found a suspected gang member shot dead in the lobby of the building. This may remind one of the film New Jack City, where a Harlem kingpin named Nino Brown, played by Wesley Snipes, takes over an entire building to operate his drug enterprise out of. Although a highly dramatized version compared to what was taking place in the building at 157th Street, interestingly enough, one of the writers of New Jack City, Barry Michael Cooper, grew up in and around the Washington Heights neighborhood. The Jerry Curls could be seen waving guns and firing off shots into the air for no reason other than to make themselves known. By now, the gang had grown to over 20 members, which included bodyguards, packagers, and lookouts. They had underlings moving their product on the street and hitmen on call 24-7 to eliminate rivals. Of the five brothers, Rafi Martinez was known to be particularly vicious. Rafi had several girlfriends, and one of them was a girl named Ida, who also worked for him. After Rafi had moved on from Ida, he married her off to his brother Augusto. One day, Ida had made fun of Rafi's limp, and Rafi responded by shooting her in the kneecap. Then there was a time when Rafi suspected several of his workers of stealing from him, so they were tied up and beaten for a week, until Rafi realized he had accused the wrong parties. When Rafi came to suspect another worker of stealing from him, he dealt with him in a less elaborate manner and shot him in the leg. When a 19-year-old Jerry Curl member named Secre had become discontent with his wages, he started a side hustle of selling crack after he finished working for the Jerry Curls. When the Jerry Curls discovered this, one day they took Secre for a ride through the Bronx and Moreta shot him in the head. Secre was then pushed out of a moving vehicle off of an exit ramp on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Over the years, the Jerry Curls employed hundreds of Dominican immigrants, using them for a variety of roles and paying them a few hundred dollars a week. 
This was convenient for the jerry curls because these Dominican transients were a plentiful and disposable resource which could easily be replaced in the event of deportation, arrest, or death. Many of these young Dominican subordinates would patrol the front of the building with walkie-talkies. When they alerted their superiors to a raid, the gang would hide their contraband in the apartment trap doors, under floor tiles, and behind ceiling fixtures. The floors would then be splashed with ammonia to throw off the police dog scent. In the early 90s, it was estimated that New York City had over 100 gangs operating on its streets. Around this time, the city saw the rise of more Latin gangs, several of which had a high Dominican constituent, such as the Trinitarios and the Young Talented Children. One Dominican gang which rivaled the viciousness of the Jerry Curls was known as the Wild Cowboys, led by the Sepulvidas, two brothers of Dominican descent. They operated out of a different part of Washington Heights as well as the South Bronx and wreaked havoc and mayhem across their territories. According to the New York Drug Enforcement Task Force, the Jerry Curl supplier was an infamous man named Pedro Corporan, also known as Pedro Cabrera. Corporan was the leader of a radical political group called the Dominican Revolutionary Party. Corporan was a top executive for a public relations firm as well as an anti-drug activist, yet it's alleged that he was delivering up to 10 kilos of cocaine a week to the Jerry Curls. In the near future, Corporan would be busted in an undercover money laundering sting for delivering $2 million to undercover DEA agents. Then he would go on the run. One day, a Jerry Curl safe house was robbed by a crew of bandits, and the thieves knew exactly where the drugs were hidden. The youngest brother, Danielle, was hung out of a window during the robbery and was pistol whipped so severely that he had to be hospitalized. Rafi had suspected that an associate of his named Rafael Espinal, who had helped the gang set up their apartments for their drug operations, was playing both sides. So Rafi had Espinal shot in the head and chest and dumped in a park and left for dead. Rafi also didn't forget about his old partner, Chino, who had betrayed him and tried to kill him. In the summer of 1990, Rafi had learned of Chino's whereabouts in the Bronx and had his eyes set on revenge. So one day, Rafi, along with his uncle Moreta and his brother Loren, took a trip across the river to the Bronx. They waited in the vicinity of Chino's building for four hours until he finally emerged with a friend and got into his car. Moreta pulled up alongside Chino at a red light and Rafi and Loren rolled down their windows, called out Chino's name, and unleashed a hail of gunfire at Chino, killing him instantly and wounding his friend. Rafi would name the 45 caliber gun that he used in the killing La China for its role in his sweet retribution. As 1991 rolled around, most of the residents at 614 West 157th Street adapted to living under the rule of the Jerry Curls. They would show the Martinez brothers a nod of respect while keeping a safe distance. One tenant even said that the gang was polite and would help her up the steps with groceries. All of the residents had resigned to the rules of looking the other way to the gang's operations, except for one man, a 66-year-old man named Jose Reyes. Jose Reyes was a retired social worker who had expressed his dismay at the going-ons in the building and planned to confront the gang. Jose's neighbor and co-worker, who knew him to be outspoken, had warned him not to meddle with the gang, but Jose had disregarded her advice. In May of 1991, Jose Reyes had confronted several members of the gang and expressed his objection at them selling drugs out of his building. Not long after this, somebody broke into Reyes' apartment and left a death threat, although this didn't appear to deter the strong-headed Reyes. Soon after Reyes confronted the gang, one of their apartments was raided, then padlocked by the NYPD. The gang assumed that Jose Reyes must be working with the police, but as it turns out, Reyes was not responsible for the raid. A few days later, on May 23, 1991, Jose Reyes went out to run some errands on Broadway when a thin man in a striped polo shirt approached him from behind and shot him dead in broad daylight. The message was loud and clear to the neighborhood residents, don't interfere with the Jerry Curls. Following Reyes' publicized murder, there was nobody in the Jerry Curls building who would talk to police. Soon the code of silence would permeate the rest of the Washington Heights neighborhood. Due to the area's thriving cocaine trade, federal agents nicknamed Washington Heights Miami on the Hudson. The local cops of the 34th precinct of the Fort Washington neighborhood of Washington Heights, who struggled to get information from people about crimes they have witnessed, 
had another name for the neighborhood. They called it Fort Yonose. In early 1991, business was good for the Jerry Curls, and they were on track to pull in over $5 million in sales that year. They had moved out to a house in Queens while their subordinates stayed back at the building at 157th Street handling operations for them. During the peak of the Jerry Curl gang's reign, the leader of the gang, Rafi Martinez, invested a large amount of cash income into the Dominican Republic. This included three houses, a gas station, and many automobiles. Rafi was apparently looking to his future return to DR and preparing for a retirement of sorts. While the building residents refused to cooperate or offer up any evidence on the gang, the feds found other means to gather intel, with undercover drug buyers and hundreds of hours of surveillance on the Jerry Curls. And soon it would catch up with them. On July 2nd, 1991, Lorenzo Martinez headed to the house in Queens to fetch some money. Like their apartments, the Jerry Curls had their vehicles rigged with secret trapdoors. Lorenzo had stashed contraband in the car's secret trapdoors and headed back to Manhattan through the Triborough Bridge, where he was pulled over by police and had his car searched. To open the car's secret compartments took an elaborate number of steps. Somehow, the police knew the car's secrets. First, you had to turn on the car's lights. Then you had to step on the brake pedal. Then you had to connect two points with a coin under the dashboard, and only then would the secret compartment in the back seat open on both sides. The police confiscated over $22,000 in cash, a loaded 45 caliber handgun, a loaded 44 caliber revolver, and 20 rounds of ammo, and Loren was arrested. As a result of a heavy investigation by the Drug Task Force, along with the work put in by Officer James Gilmore, by October of 1991, the five Martinez brothers, their uncle Moretta, and 18 other members of the Jerry Curls gang were arrested. The Martinez brothers were indicted on numerous charges. The Jerry Curls entered trial at the end of 1992. The Martinez brothers, who ranged in age from the youngest, Danielle, now 19 years old, to the oldest, Papine, age 26, all entered court without a single Jerry Curl hairstyle to be seen amongst them, and they were all now sporting short haircuts and clean shaves. As witnesses were terrified to testify against the Jerry Curls, cutting deals with co-conspirators was often the only way to proceed. During the subsequent trial, the Jerry Curls became unraveled and began testifying against one another. One of those to cooperate was Augusto Martinez, who testified against his own brothers. Another one to testify was Ida, the ex-girlfriend that Rafi had shot in the kneecap. These testimonies, along with a mountain of evidence, provided a very strong case for the jury. Lorenzo Loren Martinez and a Jerry Curl gang member named Roberto Gonzalez were charged with the murder of Jose Reyes, but they would eventually be acquitted. However, they would be convicted on numerous other offenses. After a five-month trial concluded, in April of 1993, Loren would receive a sentence of 75 years to life. Papin, as well as his uncle Moreta, each received 25 to life. Roberto Gonzalez received a 12 to 25 year sentence. The youngest brother, Daniel, received a three to nine year sentence. Due to Augusto Martinez's cooperation against his brothers, he was sentenced to several years behind bars, but he was released from federal prison eight months after the conclusion of the trial. Rafael Rafi Martinez was convicted on numerous counts, including murder in the second degree, criminal sale of a controlled substance, and sale of a firearm. He was sentenced to a total of 213 years in prison. The Jerry Curl gang had been dismantled forever. Following the takedown of the Jerry Curls, the Wild Cowboys would soon follow and the top Dominican gangs of New York City at the time would be toppled. As the Dominican gangs in New York dwindled, they began popping up in other cities in the New York tri-state area, like Hartford, Connecticut and Patterson, New Jersey. During his time behind bars, Rafi earned a GED, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree from Global University. In his spare time, Rafi has worked as a teacher's aide, an HIV peer educator, and a clerk in the law library. He also became deeply religious. The Rockefeller drug law reform of 2004 allowed those convicted of drug offenses to be considered for resentencing. During a resentencing hearing in 2006, Rafi Martinez spoke to the court and denounced his days as a gangster who terrorized the neighborhood around 157th Street. 
He asked for leniency, saying, I regret what I did. I am ashamed of my past behavior. I was selfish and unconscionable and irresponsible. I apologize to the city of New York. Rafi's lawyer argued that he should be allowed to see a parole board sometime around 2053, about the time of his 85th birthday. But the DA was unmoved by Rafi's speech and denied the resentencing request for him and his two brothers. The DA argued that the drug resentencing laws were in place to benefit non-violent low-level offenders, not violent drug kingpins like the Jerry Curls. Rafael Rafi Martinez will die in prison. Lorenzo Loren Martinez will likely suffer the same fate. Cesar Papin Martinez was released on parole in 2016 after serving 23 years of his 25-year sentence. The Jerry Curls' careers as a fearsome gang were even shorter lived than the hairstyle from which they derived their namesake. The Jerry Curls' rise was fast, their peak was short, and their collapse was immense. The five Martinez brothers came to the U.S. and saw their American dream by seizing the open crack market in New York City. But like all criminal organizations who operate with brazenness and flash, their hubris would be their own downfall. As gangs dwindled and crime dissipated, the Washington Heights neighborhood of Manhattan saw a major turnaround. The once dreaded area has seen its share of gentrification as well as the rise of the real estate market. A neighborhood once riddled with crime is now rife with restaurants, bars, and businesses. While still an urban area with its share of drugs and violence, the days where a gang like the Jerry Curls could take over an entire building and operate their drug business in plain sight are over. Three of the Martinez brothers are now free. Maybe they're back in the Dominican Republic or maybe they're still here in New York City. Perhaps they tell their friends the tale of when they were feared gangsters who ruled the neighborhood of Washington Heights with an iron fist. Or maybe Augusto Martinez tries to bury those days and still bears the burden of selling out his own bloodline. Whatever the case, the Jerry Curl Gang is a classic recurring tale of the ills that result from the cutthroat business of drugs and gangs. Although there would be numerous Dominican gangs to appear after the demise of the Jerry Curls, few would be as iconic as a flashy crew of siblings known as much for their viciousness as for their glamorous hairstyles.